I want to say a few words about divine mercy on this feast of divine mercy on during this hour of divine mercy now you know of course of saint faustina she's the polish nun who died in 1938 at the age of 33 she had wonderful mystical graces her life story is a beautiful story won't get into it here this afternoon but the lord called her he called her to be the apostle of divine mercy and boy did she do a good job the lord also called her to be the secretary of his mercy and she wrote about her mystical experiences and her um, locutions and visions of the Lord Jesus in a diary called Divine Mercy in My Soul. Who's heard of this diary before? Almost everyone, of course. She also gave us um, the chaplet of Divine Mercy, which we're going to sing shortly. Also the novena of Divine Mercy. Many of us are finishing it today. The Feast of Divine Mercy today, that comes from St. Faustina. It, there was already a sense of celebrating Divine Mercy on this day, but uh, through St. Faustina, it's become more official and prominent. She's also um, popularized the Hour of Mercy. Here we are during the Hour of Mercy. And also she gave us the image of Divine Mercy. And uh, what I want to focus on this afternoon is the image of divine mercy. Now, I noticed some of the youth from our youth group who are here. I gave this same talk, I think it was last Friday night. So if you're one of the youth, feel free to daydream for the next 10 or 15 minutes. And if some people are wondering, well, what is Mark, what, what's Father Mark telling those young people? Well, this is the talk I gave them on Friday night. Okay. Divine mercy, the image of divine mercy, the Lord Jesus appeared to St. Faustina and he said to her, have an image painted of what you see. And so she received permission from her superiors. They found a painter. She described to the painter what to paint. He painted it and she writes... When she saw, when I saw that, I, that it was not as beautiful as Jesus, I felt very sad about it. This is when she saw the painting that the painter painted. She said, I returned home alone. I went immediately to the chapel and I wept a good deal. She went home and cried. I said to the Lord, who will paint you as beautiful as you are? Then I heard these words, not in the beauty of the color, nor of the brush lies the greatness of this image, but in my grace. In other words, no one, no one could paint an image that does justice to the beauty, the majesty, the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord Jesus, he promises a grace, a grace who gaze, to those who gaze upon this image. And this has now become one of the world's most well-known images of our Lord Jesus all around the world. The image of divine mercy is displayed and, and, and reverenced. It's an, it's an image that transmits grace. It's an image, you could say, very much of today's gospel. It's kind of like an illustrated form of a lot of today's gospel. So what I want to do is I want to draw attention Hope you can all see it well here. I want to draw attention to some aspects of the image of divine mercy so we can better understand it. First of all, you will notice that in the image, our Lord Jesus has his hand raised in blessing. He doesn't have a two by four to hit us over the head with, or he doesn't have a sword to, to start you know, attacking people, or, or, or his hand isn't in a clenched fist in anger. No. No, he comes to bless us. And it's like the God who made us, who so, whom so many people are frightened of, you know, so many people are, don't, don't, don't trust the God who made us. When he comes to us, 
He comes to us not to hurt us, but to bless us. As, as the Lord Jesus said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might have life through him. And so it's interesting too, the gospel today in pretty much any time the Lord Jesus visits someone or our blessed mother appears to someone or St. Michael the archangel or St. Gabriel a, heaven, a heavenly angel appears to someone, almost always the first thing they say is, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid because I guess that's our, 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 our reaction, a heavenly being. We're afraid, and, and the Lord tells us, do not be afraid. And, and you could say, again, as he comes to us, his hand raised in blessing, it's like he's saying what our blessed mother said to the children of Fatima when she first appeared to them on May 13th. Uh, she said to them, be not afraid. I won't hurt you. <laughs> Which is so, so simple. It's, it's, it's kind of like if you have a, a young child, maybe who's lost and afraid and crying, well, you want to go help that child. But if the child's afraid, you have to do the same. You have to say, hey, it's okay. It's okay. I'm going to help you. I'm not going to hurt you. And so again, the Lord, he comes to aching humanity with his mercy, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Okay, the second thing we notice in this image is our Lord Jesus, he's stepping forward. And this is very important because remember, the God who made us, he did indeed rend the heavens and come down. He came, as the Lord said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came to rescue us and redeem us. He's the bridegroom of our soul who came to rescue his bride. And so he, he is the one who initiates. He comes to us. He's searching for us. He even leaves the 99. He goes after the one lost sheep. And so we see the Lord Jesus. He is indeed initiating and approaching us. He's, he wants to draw close to us. The third thing we notice in this image is that the Lord Jesus, he's pointing somewhere. And that's kind of the center of the image. The Lord Jesus is pointing to his heart. And we all know what that means. When you point to your heart, you're telling someone, I love you. The Lord Jesus is drawing our attention to his, his heart, his meek and humble heart. He loves us so much. But also, we know that this is the heart that was pierced. It's a heart that was pierced, and he's reminding us of that. Yes, we know. He was betrayed and scourged and beaten and tortured and crucified. And his heart was pierced. And that was out of love for us. He took upon himself our sins so that we could live forever. That's the, the lover of our soul. He came and he paid the price for us. He shed his blood for us. He died for us so that we could have eternal life with him to redeem us. And so he's pointing to not only his heart, but the heart that was pierced. And this is so important. It's interesting. It's in John's gospel that it's highlighted that our Lord Jesus' heart was pierced. In John 19, it says, But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. His heart was pierced. Blood and water flowed out. We understand the medical reality of, of, of that. But then John reminds us of a key scripture, a very important scripture. Zechariah, the prophet says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. John, the evangelist, he's interpreting, he's telling us what's happening here. And if we go back to Zechariah, there's a prophetic promise. It says, they will look on him whom they have pierced, and on that day, a fountain will be opened to purify from sin and uncleanness. 
You see, Lord, our Lord Jesus, his heart was pierced and a fountain was opened to purify us and to cleanse us. That's what he's pointing to. And it's very interesting when we look at the gospel that is connected to this image, we see the Lord Jesus instituting the sacrament of confession, reconciliation, the forgiveness of sin, this fountain that purifies us, cleanses us. And so the Lord Jesus is pointing to his pierced heart and from his heart, we see these rays, this life, this light, this power coming from his heart. And there's the white rays, the pale rays, and the, the red rays. And in the introduction here, it quotes the diary. It's, it says, the pale rays, that's the white rays, stands for the water which makes souls righteous. It wipes away our sins. It cleanses us. It purifies us. The red ray stands for the blood, which is the life of souls. Did you know that? The life is in the blood. Our young people who are here who come to youth group, they know this. We did a whole evening on the blood of Jesus. Scripture says the life is in the blood. And our Lord Jesus is a divine person. His blood gives divine life, eternal life. You drink his blood, you live forever, as it says in John 6. And then it goes, and it says, happy is the one who will dwell in their shelter, dwelling in the shelter of these rays. You live in the grace that comes th th through the heart of Jesus, through the sacraments, baptism, confession, Holy Eucharist, your home, you dwell there. And then it says, the sacraments of baptism and penance purify the soul and the Eucharist most abundantly nourishes it. That's what the Lord Jesus points to, the life that comes from his heart. The fourth thing we notice in the image, or the fourth reality of the image is again, it's meant to be displayed in a special way for today. The feast of divine mercy. And the gospel for today goes back centuries. The gospel for today is nothing new. And the gospel, today's gospel is very much related, this image is a visual of today's gospel. And let me just remind us, because this is, this is what happens today in a particular way and in front of this image. It says, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. We're all afraid of something we shouldn't be afraid of. We're all struggling with fear, even though the Lord tells us, be not afraid. Your father takes care of the birds. He'll also take care of you. Every hair of your head is numbered. They were afraid, locked up. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. If someone looks upon this image and wonders, well, what, what's Jesus saying? The first and most important central thing he's saying when you gaze upon this image is, peace be with you. And we see this repeated a number of times. Our Lord Jesus, he never said, peace be with you in the Gospels until he died and rose. Did you know that? You know why? Because Adam and Eve, our first parents, when they were created, they were created with the peace of God, divine peace. But when they rebelled against God and were disobedient, they lost that deep peace Ever since then, humanity hasn't had the deep peace. We've been restless. There's been an ache, and uh, an anxiety, a lack of peace. But the Lord Jesus, by dying for us and ra rising up again, he restores the deep peace peace of knowing we're reconciled to God. All is forgiven. We're loved unconditionally. Peace be with you. It's restored after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced. 
When they saw the Lord, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Any experience of God is a mission. It's ascending. When we receive God's grace, we have to do something with it. Did you hear me say that in the homily today? If you're, you're here for, for, for the Sunday Mass, you have to give it away. So there's ascending. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a breath of God breathing on his children in Scripture. You know where it is. It's in Genesis. When God created our first parents, it said, God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. The breath of God is the Holy Spirit. It's the life of God. It's the love of God. It's the person of, of, of the, the third person of the Trinity. It's God himself breathed into our first parents. But when they bit into the apple, remember, you'll die. When they bit into that apple, they lost the divine life, the breath of the Spirit. They grew old, they withered, and they died. They lost their immortality. And so the first thing Jesus does after he pays the price and restores everything is he gives back the divine breath that makes us live forever. He breathes back into us his Holy Spirit and the peace is restored. And this is through the forgiveness of sin. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Instituting the sacrament of reconciliation, confession. Some people say, well, where in the Bible does it say that a priest can forgive sin? Right there. Right there. There it is. Black and white, straight from the mouth of our Lord Jesus. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. Go to confession. Go to a priest. Receive the forgiveness of Jesus through this sacrament instituted by Christ himself. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas... He wasn't there. He didn't believe, doubting Thomas. He said, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days after, what's today? It's the eighth day of the octave. Today is eight days after. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Almost every artistic depiction of Thomas at at this moment, Thomas is looking into the side of Christ. And Thomas doesn't just see a wound. It's like, whoa, that's a serious wound. That's a deep wound. No, He sees the source of life. He sees all divine grace. He looks into the heart of God. When he looks into the side of Christ, he sees the heart of God, this infinite abyss of mercy and power and love. And what's his reaction? The Lord says, reach out your hand, put it in my side. Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. He recognizes this is God the Son. This is God who rent the heavens. He came down to give us his divine life. Whoever believes in him will live forever. And this is the the highest Christological statement in, in Scripture. My Lord and my God. And so again, this image, it's an illustration of what we read on Divine Mercy Sunday, what we've read for centuries on this beautiful feast. The image, the last thing about the image is the image was, our Lord Jesus said, sign the image on the bottom. Right on the image, Jesus 
I trust in you. And this is all the Lord asks of us. He doesn't want us to be afraid of him. He doesn't want us to think he's not on our side. He doesn't want us to think he's going to hit us over the head with a two by four that he's come to condemn us. No, he wants to save us. Again, he's like the person approaching the child who's in trouble, saying to the child, don't be afraid, I'll help you. You have nothing to fear. You can trust me. So many people in our world today, they don't trust the Lord Jesus They think the Lord Jesus is going to ruin their life. All their fun will be over. They think that somehow Jesus' desires for them won't be fulfilling. What foolishness. The Lord Jesus came that we may have life in abundance and eternal life. And so the Lord, he wants all of humanity to know his love, to know his mercy, and to trust him. And we need to let let this message be known to the whole world. Let the whole world know you can trust Jesus. You can give your life to him and surrender your life to him. He will cleanse you and give you eternal life, give you a joy that no one can take away, a peace that is not of this world, and life in abundance, and fill you with his everlasting love. And so as we pray the chapel of divine mercy now, let's allow the love of the Lord and his mercy to flow through us and for all for whom we are going to pray during this holy hour.